And sometimes we're like, but if only, if only I had this, and if only I had children, if only I had a, a marriage, if only I had that job, if only this, if only I was wealthy, if only I was powerful, you fill in the blank. If only, if only, if only, if we make that our primary driver and we exchange the worship that should be going upward, it goes outward and blow things up. We're gonna blow up our own life. We're gonna blow up our family. We're gonna blow up communities. Very dangerous. Solomon blows up the entire nation because of chapter two of Ecclesiastes. We're not in a Mother's Day passage today, but I believe there's some truth, not just for moms or women's in the, women in the room, but for all of us here today. We are in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, it's nestled there, Proverbs and Psalms and Song of Solomon. It's in, it's in the genre of literature that we call the wisdom literature. Ecclesiastes, whether Solomon wrote it or not, it's in, written in the personification of Solomon from his life experience. Another reason why I'm, I'm thinking more and more he didn't write it is this, the preacher as he writes this book comes to the conclusion that everything is vanity and there's almost a spirit of repentance as you go through the 12 chapters of this book. But we have no record of that in Solomon's life. Solomon dies at the age of 55, having reigned for 40 years. This book is written through his, through his eyes. He's, he dies at the age of 55 of natural causes. Someone similar in our modern culture who lived a similar life and died at a similar age, his name was Steve Jobs. Probably most of us in the room, there's something in our pocket or in our hand that we've been impacted by him. He died at the age of 54. Steve Jobs says this at the end of his life as he's on his deathbed. Aside from work, I have very little joy. In the end, wealth is only a fact of life that I am accustomed to. At this moment, lying on the sick bed, recalling my whole life, I realized that all the recognition and wealth that I took so much pride in have paled and become meaningless in the face of impending death one of the richest men in the world at the time of his death. He says, whether we drink a bottle of $300 or $10 wine, the hangover is the same. Whether the house we live in is 300 square feet or 3,000 square feet, loneliness is the same feeling. Whether you fly first class or economy class, if the plane goes down, you go down with us. Steve Jobs, not, not that long ago, 54. What's he saying? He's saying the same thing the author of Ecclesiastes is saying. Life is meaningless. At the end of the day, we're all going to face death. And our toil and our work here under the sun is all in vain. What, what I want to do today is look at the first 10 verses of chapter 2. We won't have time to get through the whole chapter I want to look at Solomon's life, what happened, where'd things go wrong? How did he become his own worst enemy? How did he blow up not only his life, but his family and the nation? And then I want to spend a few minutes talking about you and talking about me and making sure we don't do the same thing. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 1. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this was all vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. What use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart with gilding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of men to do under heaven during the few days of my life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted them in all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forests of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of things, kings and provinces. 
I got singers, both men and women and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. What's the author saying? He's, he's done everything. Everything that his wealth would allow him to experience. He had wealth and he had power. He pursued it all. He, verses one through three, I've done it all, he says. I've done it all. If it can be done, I've done it. And what's important to note is Solomon started off well. You and I are not judged by how we start, are we? It's how we finish. It's irrelevant how well Solomon started his kingdom. It has everything to do with how you end. And for all of us, that's good news, right? It's never too late. One of the truths of today. But David, on his deathbed, he He's dying and he, after reigning for 40 years, the same amount of time that his son's going to reign, 40 years, he, he says, I want to see Solomon. He brings Solomon before him. Solomon, uh, his mom is Bathsheba. Bathsheba, some of you might remember the story. Uh, David and Bathsheba and it was an affair, adulterous affair, but Solomon comes out of that relationship and, and David says, Solomon, I, I, on my deathbed, here's what I want to tell you. In, in first, first Kings chapter two, I believe, he says, don't forsake God. Follow God and all his commandments and it will go well with you. Don't forget. Don't forget God. So Solomon starts off well, but he goes astray and he begins to pursue all these things. Verses one through three, he says, I've done it all. Verses four through six, he says, I've made it all. He lists all the things that he made. Let me give you a few of them. Uh, in the chapter in Kings and Chronicles, Kings and Chronicles are history books to give us more insight into the life of Solomon. He had a vacation home. Now, some of us, God's allowed us to have a vacation home up north. Maybe that, that's you, okay? He, Solomon had the vacation home of vacation homes. Everything was built in gold. Now, maybe you're lucky you have that getaway vacation cabin. You, you bring your cheap dishes there because you're not there that long. All of his dishes at his vacation home were gold. Everything was, was gold. His primary residence took him 10 years to build. And he didn't just use the common lumber of the day, sycamore. He used mahogany. Mahogany for, for everything. In order to use that wood, he had to build the forests that were going to provide the wood. So he had to then create gardens and pools of water for the trees to sit in in order to water those. So he created the forest that he's going to use the wood to build uh, a judgment hall where he would go to rule over cases. Then he had the vacation home. He had his main residence. He also, by the way, built the temple. God told David, I'm not going to allow you to build the temple, but your son Solomon. So he builds the temple. The guy was busy. He built a lot of things. He said, hey, if it could be made, I made it. He built it. And he spared no expense. There was no one as wealthy as Solomon in, in his day. No one before him. And some would say no one since him. The wisest man to ever live, the irony is, though he did not use his wisdom as God had asked him to. I've had it all, verses 7 and through 9. So he's chasing all these things, right? He's, he's experienced it all. He's chased he talks about he's chased entertainment. He's chased pleasure. He's chased alcohol. He's chased substances. Whatever it is, he's chased entertainment. He's experienced it all. He's done it all. He's made it all. He's had it all. Verses seven through nine. He had multi-generational families working for him. Now, one of the benefits of Solomon, Reagan would be proud because his wealth trickled down. And so everyone in Solomon's family and all those who worked for him, all been, economy was good under the reign of Solomon. The wealth trickled down. He had 12,000 horsemen, 1 Kings chapter 10 says. He had 1,400 chariots. He had 150,000 forced laborers. Here it says slaves, forced laborers to build all these things, right? He had workers to make things happen. Silver was a common metal in the day because 
gold was used for everything in Solomon's home. So common citizens had silver cedar as plentiful as sycamore. Rich mahogany, how did he gain his wealth? From taxes, from deals with negotiations with other nations. He married many, many women from so many, they don't name them here because I don't know if he knew all of their names. 700 wives, so I'm doing the math, that's 700 mother-in-laws. <laughs> Three, 300 concubines, uh, that's a lot of marriage counseling. Uh, that's, that's just a lot. Why did he have all of them? Because, because he was marrying women and daughters of other nations, a, a complete disobedience of what God had asked him to do. And at the end of Solomon's life, he is a pagan king. What does it mean to be a pagan king? He's not following God. Solomon becomes a pagan king, chases after everything under the sun, pleasure, wealth, women, alcohol, you name it, power, he had it all. Entertainment, pleasure. And at the end of his life, he not only blows up his life, he not only blows up his family's life, but he ends up blowing up the entire nation of Israel. Now, some of us can relate to Psalm here. We, we don't have his wealth. We don't have his power. Maybe, maybe as we read this, this is an extreme case. But some of us, if we're honest, we, we would say, yeah, there's, there's been some things in my life that I've made an idol. And when we make an idol, what we're doing is we're making an idol in our image. In my image, I make idols and then I become the God of that idol. I, I make an idol and then I get to decide when I use that idol and how that idol serves me and pleases me. And we could all share stories of things that we've chased after and we thought were going to fulfill us. Alcohol could be for one. We all, if I sat down and had coffee with all of us somewhere in your family tree, there's probably an alcoholic. Or maybe there is, but they've not yet admitted it. That's just one. A long list here in chapter two of Ecclesiastes. This is a very relevant chapter for our culture and society today. Everything under the sun, everything on earth that you chase after, you are grasping for it, but in the end, you are gasping for air because it is exhausting as we saw last week. It will not complete you. It will not fulfill you. There will be no purpose to your life. Ashes to ashes. We sang a song today that wasn't that line, but the Bible talks about ashes to ashes, dust to dust. If you serve yourself, that is how your life will end. Meaningless with no purpose. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> but that is not the end of the story. I'm so grateful that's not the end of the story. Solomon dies of natural causes at the age of 55. There are now, we go into the Boams, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Rehoboam is Solomon's son. Jeroboam is the man who oversaw the forced laborers. At that point when Solomon dies, not only has he blown up his life, but the shrapnel of his life is now going to impact many others. The decisions that you and I make, there is no victimless sin. And the decisions that you and I make, we may think it's only going to impact me. It will impact those closest to you. You cannot deny that. You cannot get away from that. The decisions that you think are being made in private, one day those decisions will be made public. Decisions made in private one day will be public. You get to decide how many people are going to be a part of that decision on the front end by inviting people in and asking for the wisdom and counsel. Wise voices lead to wise choices. Do you have wise people in your life? What happened to King Solomon? What happened? He put himself, he surrounded himself with people who only needed things from him or wanted things from him. They needed him or they wanted him. That is a very dangerous place to be. If you put yourself and you surround yourself with people who need you or want things from you, they will not be honest with you. 
Find yourself people who can speak truth to you, who, who won't gain or lose based on the decision that you're going to make. And many of us may say, well, it's no business of anybody else what I choose to do. Have you ever heard that? Maybe not, but you're going to, a wise person is going to invite people into their life, invite them in and say, I want my business to be your business. I want you to speak truth to me. Rehoboam, I'm gonna sum up the story, Solomon's son. The people, the forced laborers come to Rehoboam, who's now going to be the next king. And they say to him, would you have mercy? Would you be more merciful to 150,000 slaves than your father Solomon was? And he gives them a response, which is actually starts off well. He's a pretty good response. He says, give me three days and I'll get back to you. First Kings 10, 11, and 12 sums all this up. Give me three days. Let me think about it. That is a very wise answer. Somebody comes to you with the decision. Give, let me give you three days. And then the next decision, again, very wise. He's like, let me check with the elders. Very wise. The people who've, who've lived life, they've got wisdom. Let me go and check with the elders. From there on, it's all downhill after that. Because he comes back and says, well, let me ask my buddies who I grew up with and my best friends. Would, would, they're asking him to be gracious to the slave laborers. And he comes back and he says, you thought Solomon, Rehoboam comes back and you thought my dad was rough on the slaves? My pinky is greater than Solomon's waist. My pinky is stronger than Solomon's waist. Now, what's he saying? Solomon was a very large man. He's a very large man. Uh, the size of people back then indicated the wealth and prosperity. That's still true in some parts of the world. He was very healthy and very wealthy. And it was very clear when people looked at him that he was wealthy and healthy, if you know what I mean. Rehoboam, his son says, I'm going to be more strict than my father was. The elder's advice was, if you are kind to them and you give them a 401k package and you give them a day off, they will serve you very well. He instead, he turns up the intensity and forces forces more. And what ends up happening, he didn't take the advice. He didn't listen to wise counsel. Very dangerous place to be. And some of us have wise counsel in our life and we justify it away by saying things like, well, they haven't lived life in my shoes or they're not my age. They're older than me or they're younger than me or they don't really understand what's, what I'm going through. And I'm just saying that's a caution. Caution Put yourself in a position to humble yourself to receive good counsel from different people. Listen, good decisions, really good decisions and good ideas, you don't need to convince yourself to do them, right? Because they're good decisions. That's a no-brainer. The things that we're doing oftentimes in bad decisions, we're, we're talking ourselves into it. The bad decisions in my life that I've made we line them all up, list them all out. There's one common denominator, me. I was a part of every bad decision that I've ever made. The same is true in your life. And sometimes we've made decisions in our life. We sabotage our life. We chase things. And here's a few things I would just, I would just say as we look at Solomon who sabotages, sabotages his, his life, his family, Family is a disaster. And the nation of Israel from this point on is divided because of, the, because of the choices that Solomon made. From this point on, it's a civil war. You got the north and the south in the nation of Israel. You have Jeroboam who takes two and Rehoboam. And God says, I'm gonna keep my end of the deal. I'm gonna make sure that the, the Messiah, Jesus, is gonna come from the tribe of Benjamin, I'm going to make sure David, that those two, I'm going to keep my end of the deal. But because Solomon, you rejected me and you're a pagan king, you chased after the idols of all these other women. I'm going to, you're going to live with the consequences of, of your choices. God keeps his end of the deal. And God gives us boundaries and he gives us his word because he loves us and he cares about us. And he, he's, some of the decisions that we're making, there are more red flags going off than, than Switzerland has, right? And there are people coming alongside of us and say, hey, I see things that you don't see. Can I be honest with you? 
They're connecting dots that you and I are, are not connecting. Some of us in the room, if we're honest, we could say, yeah, I've, I've chased some things in my life. And I've come to the very same conclusion that the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes has come to. It's all meaningless. And everything under the sun, S-U-N, is meaningless. And vanity of vanity, dust to dust, dust and ashes to ashes. That every decision that you and I make not only impacts you, but impacts the people in your future. Scripture tells us decisions made will impact generations of people, sin and blessing. And all of us in the room are responsible for our behavior, how it impacts other people. How, how we choose to live our life is not just important to us, but to everyone around us. A few things. Pay attention to the tension. If you feel tension before you make a decision, that's oftentimes the conscience that Romans 1 says God has placed and written on every one of our hearts. We all have a conscience. If it doesn't feel right, maybe you're thinking, yeah, my mom wouldn't approve of this. Don't do it. That's just good advice in life. If mom's not going to approve of this, don't do it. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Pay attention to the narrative. You have a filter. Uh, we all have a filter. That filter has been designed based on our experiences of life and based upon how we view things like alcohol and pleasure and entertainment. We all have a filter and a narrative. And I just want to caution everybody in the room. It's all broken. How you and I view things is broken because of sin. It's a brokenness. And you and I were the most powerful creatures that God made. I'm not talking about size. There, there's some amazing creatures that God made. We are the most powerful creatures that God made. And with that, he gave us an incredibly powerful desire within us. And that desire, if it is not upward and it goes externally, it is dangerous. And we begin to make idols and we come to the end of our life. And I chased after all these things and it's all meaningless the desire that God created in us is to worship him and him alone. It's for you to have a personal relationship with God's son. His name is Jesus who came to earth to live a perfect life. That is the only thing on this side under the sun that will give you meaning and purpose. And sometimes we're like, but if only, if only I had this and if only I had children, if only I had a, a marriage, if only I had that job, if only this, if only I was wealthy, if only I was powerful, you fill in the blank. If only, if only, if only, if we make that our primary driver and we exchange the worship that should be going upward and it goes outward and blow things up. We're gonna blow up our own life. We're gonna blow up our family. We're gonna blow up communities. Very dangerous. Solomon blows up the entire nation because of chapter two of Ecclesiastes. It's a sad portrayal. The final one, I said, pay attention to the tension, pay attention to the narrative, pay attention to the wisdom in your life. Surround yourself with people who can speak truth into your life, who do not gain from what they tell you based on what you're going to do for them. Have people in your life who's just gonna be honest with you. Solomon didn't do that. His son didn't do that. He surrounded Rehoboam, surrounded himself with his buddies. They're gonna tell him what he wants to hear. Make sure you have people in your life who can tell you not what you wanna hear, but the truth. Say, hey, I, most of us, if we're honest, we look back on some of the decisions we made in life, there were warning signs everywhere, right? Internally and externally. And we chose not to listen to him. God is a loving God. And he gives us people. Here at Boulder Mountain, it's a small group. It's a women's gathering. It's a men's gathering. It's a men's group, a women's group. It's friendships. Where those friendships, you don't have anything to gain or lose based on what somebody tells you. But because they love you, they're going to speak truth to you. Say, can I be honest with you? And I would encourage all of us to hear that and listen to it and receive it. At some point in our life, somebody warned us about that person, that job, that investment, that idea. Our worst decisions were preceded by a list of unwise decisions oftentimes. 
Solomon didn't wake up one day and expect to be where he was. Many people wake up one day and they didn't expect to be where they are, but it was a number of choices over the years. And here's the good news. Your life and my life is not over yet. And God has you here for a reason. Maybe you said, I'm going to come to church with my mom today, but God had another reason. He wants you to know that through Jesus, your life has meaning and purpose in a, in a relationship with Jesus. That alone, nothing else. Under this sun, when you die, it's over. No one will remember you in the end. It's over, it's done with, ashes to ashes. But in Jesus, what you do for him will echo into eternity. What you do for him will never, ever be forgotten. The upstairs hallway of the house that I grew up in, my mom, she passed away in her 50s, 23 years ago now. Uh, I love my mom. Some of the images I have in my mom, she wasn't perfect, but some of the images I have in my mom is her doing her Bible study at the kitchen table, inductive Bible study, K. Arthur. Some of you, colored pencils, the whole deal. She, I knew a few things about my mom. She prayed for us. She's passed away, but her prayers haven't. Moms, grandmothers, you want to impact the next generation? You want to impact your kids? You want to impact your grandchildren? You pray for them. It's the best thing you can do. Write out your prayers. Tell them that you're praying for them. Tell them the prayers that you're praying for them. My brother was 10 years, 10 years, walked away from God. My mom prayed for him every day. He's a pastor in Iowa doing the same thing I'm doing. But on, in the upstairs hallway, my mom had a little plaque on, hanging on the wall. I didn't understand what it meant then. It didn't make any sense. It was old English. It said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And if I can plead with you today, whatever you're chasing, would you have the courage and the humility to admit, admit it? Not on your deathbed, but to do it now. To say, hey, I've been chasing this. I thought it was gonna fulfill me. It started as just pleasure, but now it's an addiction. Would you have the courage to admit that to a friend, somebody that you trust? Admit it to God, admit it to somebody else. If you do not know Jesus, I would love to have that conversation with you today. During the last song or after service, what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus. That what you do for him, when you serve, when you give, will be remembered for eternity. Do you want your life to count? You can, you can worship yourself, you can make idols, and that'll be over the day you die. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for this example I found in, found in your word. It's just as powerful today as it was thousands of years ago. God, we admit and confess that there's been decisions that we've made in our life that have hurt us and have hurt the people around us. They've broken your heart because you love us so much. I thank you for your grace and your mercy that gives us new beginnings and fresh starts every day in you. I thank you, God, that you take ashes and you, you make them beautiful. You, you turn graves into gardens. You take our addictions. You take our brokenness. You take the poor decisions of our past. And God, you use that as fertile ground to do something new. I pray that's the case here today. I pray we would be honest with ourselves. We would be honest with you. And we would seek wise counsel. In Jesus' name, amen.